Welcome to the Nature of Teaching Professional Development Webinar Series. My name is Rod Williams, a professor and extension wildlife specialist with Purdue University Extension. Today's webinar is entitled Ecotoxicology Part 1. This will be a 30 minute webinar covering the principles of ecotoxicology, contaminants, and threats to freshwater ecosystems. If you're unfamiliar with ecotoxicology, this webinar will provide you with science based background information to prepare you for the webinar on ecotoxicology part two. So joining me today is a good friend and colleague, Dr. Jason Hooverman. Jason is an associate professor here at Purdue and a co-author on the unit on ecotoxicology. Jason's gonna be highlighting key concepts and challenges in the field of ecotoxicology throughout this webinar. And then I'll finish off highlighting additional resources and the procedure to obtain your certification of completion. So Jason, at this point, I'm gonna turn things over to you and, and you can get us started on ecotoxicology. Okay, thank you very much for the introduction, Rod. Uh, and thank you all for joining us today. So a little bit about what I'll talk about. Um, I'll go through contaminants and ecotoxicology. I also call that ecotox throughout. Um, so I'll give you a little bit of uh, overview and background uh, about the, the field. Uh, and then I'll go into three examples, uh, pesticides, pharmaceuticals, and road de-icers. Uh, all uh, contaminants that hopefully students are pretty familiar with might be um, uh, encountering in the environments um, or have actually consumed thinking about pharmaceuticals. Uh, so I guess I'm thinking about these common things that could be ending up in natural systems. And then lastly, I'll talk about some general threats to freshwater systems and talk about uh, a module we've developed, a lesson plan we've developed to uh, explore water quality. Okay, so where I like to begin in the field of ecotoxicology is to remind students about uh, the human population size and really how we've changed over time. So for most of human history, our population sizes were extremely low. Um, so we really didn't crack the 1 billion uh, mark until about the 1800s. And then from there, over the course of 200 years, we go from 1 billion people on the planet to nearly 8 billion people on the planet. Uh, so for students, this kind of underscores just how rapidly in just 200 years, the human population has really grown. And obviously this creates a number of challenges, right? We need to feed those people, we need to um, house those people, and obviously there's lots of industry that's been developed over the, that time. Uh, and that really leads us to the field of ecotoxicology and contaminants. Uh, so contaminants, what are these things? They're substances, typically we think about them as toxins, uh, that when they're introduced into the environment have the potential to harm people, wildlife, or plants. Now, as I mentioned, we tend to think about these as toxins, but there's a variety of other types of uh, substances that we might think about, including things like microplastics that are ending up in the environment. Uh, we can also think about this in terms of maybe light pollution or sound pollution due to human activity. So this is, again, kind of a more broad term uh, in terms of contaminants. Um, but one of the things I also like to remind students of is that given this rapid expansion of, uh, expansion of the human population in 200 years, these are very rapid changes, okay? And for organisms, those rapid changes are very difficult for them to adapt and to kind of deal with. So our ability to cope with those uh, changes is very challenging. And this is a significant threat for the past 200 years, especially since the time of industrialization. So the field of ecotoxicology, just very briefly a definition of this, this is the science of contaminants in the biosphere and their effects on the constituents of the biosphere. And obviously this includes humans as well. So just some basic principles of ecotox. Uh, there's really two main characteristics we're, we're interested in when it comes to toxins. The first is the dose. This is the amount or the concentration of the toxin that ends up in the environment. And secondly, we're also concerned about the persistence or the longevity of that toxin in the environment. And ultimately, it's those persistent toxins that are uh, a significant concern because they don't break down very quickly in the environment and they can end up entering food chains. So a little later on, I'll provide an example of one of these types of persistent toxins in the environment. It's also important to realize that contaminants in general can have a wide range of potential effects. And typically we think about kind of a lethal effect on an organism, right? So some contaminant, say a pesticide gets into the environment and maybe it's directly lethal to the organism that it's exposed to. Okay, but there's also a broad diversity of other types of effects, and that's what's listed here in this uh, table. So basically, we could also think about just the sublethal effects of a contaminant. So if the, the, say the contaminant does not kill the individual, you could impair its reproduction, 
its development. You could cause a mutation. It could be as simple as a behavioral change in that organism or a physiological change. So these sublethal effects are actually more commonly observed because most of the time the level of contaminants or the dose getting into the environment isn't high enough necessarily to kill an individual to be lethal, right? Um, so these sublethal extract effects are extremely important. But scaling up from there, this could also influence the population level. So a contaminant could lead to selection on a population, maybe selecting for more tolerant um, individuals to that contaminant. Um, if there's an excessive amount of that contaminant, it can actually extirpate an entire population, depending on, again, what that contaminant is and what type of habitat it gets into. Um, from there, you could also have community level effects. Okay, so once you start altering which uh, species are surviving and how many survive, this can alter food webs and lead to trophic cascades. Uh, this could also lead to biomagnification. So as I mentioned before, if you have a persistent compound, that compound can be passed from species to species all the way up the food chain. Then lastly, you could also have ecosystem level effects. And this include things like habitat destruction or alteration as a consequence of that contaminant getting into an ecosystem. So again, for students, I like to underscore, again, that we, we tend to focus on this lethal effect, but we have this broad range of other effects that can occur from sublethal all the way up to effects on ecosystems. In addition, there's things that we might not think about too often. So I'm going to provide an example of that. And that is an evolutionary response to a contaminant when the contaminant is actually not directly lethal to the organism of interest. And actually, this is one of the most well-known studies. Uh, so this um, study is based in the 1850s. Uh, it is really the first evidence that contaminant could influence evolution of an organism. And so the background here is during the Industrial Revolution, you have all this pollution and soot in particular being spewed from these factories. And what it would do is coat trees. You have all this uh, soot on the tree, it actually killed lichen on the tree and would darken the tree bark. And what they were finding is that moth populations in these areas with heavy industry had a higher frequency of this dark colored morph compared to the light colored morph. Vice versa, if we go to an agricultural area where there's less factories and less pollution, we saw the reverse. There was more of these light colored or peppered morphs and less of these dark colored morphs. And what was going on here is that these moths in the industrial area, if they were white or light colored, they would stand out more in the background and then be consumed by these birds. So this was actually an effect on predation, okay? By this contaminant getting into the environment, it wasn't directly toxic to the moths or influenced the birds directly. This is all an indirect effect of the background uh, of the soot and how that influenced how these individuals stood out in the population. So we actually see that these populations were evolving different frequencies of these different colorations as a consequence of the contaminant. So again, despite this lack of toxicity, the contaminant still impacted the species interactions within these communities. So with that broad background, uh, what I'm gonna do now is just jump into, again, three kind of common contaminants that we see um, in natural systems. And I'll start off with pesticides. So again, with pesticides, I'd like to remind students again of this growing human population. So again, we're at roughly 8 billion people on the planet, and these people need food. And this really falls on the shoulders of agriculture. Okay? So there's been lots of agricultural advances in the past 100 years um, to help provide food for the growing human population. And one of those agricultural advances has been the use of pesticides. These pesticides help control uh, pest species, such as insects or plants that might compete um, with our crops or again, consume our crops when it comes to insects. If we look at the overall usage of pesticides, it's pretty uh, amazing how much of these chemicals that we use. So focus over here on these last uh, two columns. This is the world market and then the US market in gray. And these are millions of pounds of active ingredient. Okay, so basically what this line here is, this is five billion pounds of chemical used globally of pesticides. The United States, we use just over 1 billion uh, pounds of these active ingredients. And just an interesting note that the United States, we account for 6% of the total land area on the planet, but we use about 22% of the total pesticides on the planet. So we use a disproportionate amount of these chemicals. And the other thing I'd like to underscore the students is that this is a perpetual challenge. So this is some data, it's a little dated at this point, but it gives you a feel for that this is a constant issue. 
right? So consistently, year in and year out, we're using roughly one to 1.2 billion pounds of these chemicals. So again, it's a very common challenge to our systems. And importantly, we're starting to realize that many of these chemicals can have effects on non-target species. Now for pesticides, we're obviously spraying them to these habitats to control either insect pests, maybe plant pests, but they also end up into natural systems where they can have a broad diversity of effects, as I mentioned before in the, the overview slides. But what you're seeing here is just a summary from a review paper where they've consolidated a lot of the information across various taxonomic groups from mammals all the way down to plants and fungi. And they're, what they're doing here is kind of um, summarizing effects that we know occur at the individual level, at the population, all the way up to the ecosystem level. But if you focus first here on the individual level, just kind of highlight some similarities here. When you look at mammals, we see things like neurotoxicity, immune disruption. Birds, same thing, neurotoxicity, immune disruption. Go to amphibians, neurotoxicity, immune dis uh, endocrine disruption. So importantly, across especially these verbic groups, we see very similar effects that are being observed. Uh, we're impacting the physiology of these organisms, you know, how the nervous system works. And importantly, if you think about many of these pesticides, that's exactly what it does in many of the pest species as well. Okay, so again, we see very parallel effects across these different groups. But the other thing I want to highlight just very briefly is that as you start to move to these higher levels of biological organization, get to community level, ecosystem level, we don't have as much information. Okay, we know more about the individual level and less about these kind of broader scale impacts of these contaminants on communities as well as ecosystems. So that's something that um, it's starting to grow in the literature, but we need a lot more information about these overall effects on our ecosystems. So I did want to go into a couple of examples. Um, so this is more of a historical example. So DDT or dichloral diphenyl trichloroethane. This is one of the um, most well-known of the insecticides. It was uh, largely marketed as a, a highly uh, safe pesticide that we can use. So you'll see picture in picture of this if you search for DDT. Uh, on the internet, uh, these fogging trucks that would go on beaches or down streets to control for mosquito populations. Um, so largely we're trying to prevent disease risk in humans, but this uh, pesticide was also used in cropping systems as well. So it's kind of interesting that these people are kind of smiling that they're being sprayed with this pesticide and it's you know, getting rid of mosquitoes. What we started to realize with this pesticide was it does have some harmful effects, especially on human health, so things like diabetes, reproductive effects, Alzheimer's are all linked to exposure to DDT. But from a wildlife perspective, um, really what became the poster child for the effects of this pesticide were the raptor species you see over here, as well as some other bird species. Uh, so in addition to being directly toxic to some species, for birds in particular, this became a biomagnification problem. DDT tends to accumulate in fatty tissue, so it's lipophilic. And as a consequence, it's very easily passed from animal to animal or consumer to consumer. And for birds, in particular birds of prey, when they were consuming their prey, they were taking in large levels of this uh, chemical. And unfortunately for the birds is that the chemical actually interferes with their ability to deposit calcium in their shells, in their eggs. So when these birds would go to incubate their eggs, they would sit down and actually crack their eggs. So we saw significant declines in a number of raptor species as a consequence of DDT. Now this is a pesticide that has largely been banned, but in various places of the, the, the planet, especially in more developing areas where uh, vector-borne diseases are still a big issue, you know, mosquitoes in particular, DDT is actually still used. And importantly, we still detect this in the blood of some people as well, especially older generation that were actually directly exposed to some of these chemicals. It still is persisting in their bodies. Okay, so that's an example of an older pesticide. Again, this biomagnification issue now let's fast forward to more present day technologies. And importantly, the, the chemical companies are coming up with various ways to get around things like evolved tolerance to chemicals and new ways of applying pesticides. And one that I'll focus on right now uh, are seed coatings. So what you're seeing right here are various seed coatings. And what these seed coatings are is basically you coat a seed with a pesticide. And the idea is that when the plant germinates, um, it'll take up these chemicals and provide prophylactic um, protection against various pests. And in particular, we're using this a lot with a new generation of pesticides called the neonicotinoids. Now, to give you an idea of just how much these chemicals have grown in usage, um, really, you can see just in the past 20 years how much their usage has increased over time. 
Okay. In particular, we're using it a lot on corn and soybeans. So uh, corn is in the red here, soybean is in the, the orange. And this is also just kind of a time sequence of the adoption of imidacloprid, one of the neonicotinoids. And you can just see how rapidly it's expanded in use from you know, roughly 2014 uh, or up to 2014 here. So you can see this technology has been rapidly incorporated into our approaches. But one of the challenges that we're currently trying to figure out is these chemicals end up in the soil, they can persist for a long time, and when you get heavy rain events, that can bring these chemicals into especially aquatic systems. And in these aquatic systems, we have a variety of species, including vertebrates and invertebrate species that can be exposed to these chemicals. So there's research trying to figure out right now is what risk does this pose to especially aquatic species, but more broadly, other species out in the ecosystems that could be exposed to these uh, chemicals. Okay, so that wraps up pesticides. And importantly, pesticides are things that we intentionally spray into the environment. Now I want to transition and think about pharmaceuticals. Now these are chemicals that we consume in our bodies, but we're not intentionally applying them to natural systems. And I like to bring this up because pharmaceuticals, this is really a big business. Um, so pharmaceuticals, personal care products, uh, think about some of the top companies, including Pfizer, Johnson & Johnson, Eli Lilly, they're making billions and billions of dollars in sales per year uh, for their, uh, these chemicals. And the price can include anywhere from antidepressants, birth control, lipid regulators, antibiotics, pretty much you name it, they've probably produced it. So a large diversity of chemicals. Now importantly, these chemicals um, play a vital role in human health. Okay? For many people, they require these medications, for example, to live and um, treat various ailments. But the bigger challenge is thinking about what happens when these chemicals um, are metabolized and go through our bodies, or if they are metabolized and basically pass through a human and end up in the wastewater treatment plants. Okay, basically falls on the treatment plant to remove those chemicals before that water is released back into the environment. And there's a growing concern that many of these treatment plants are not designed or have the money to update their facilities to control the release of these uh, pharmaceuticals and the diverse uh, the diversity of these pharmaceuticals that we currently have. So what you're seeing here is just some of the most commonly detected pharmaceuticals when we go out and we sample the environment. And you see a broad range of these things, including antibiotics, uh, antihypertensives, lipid regulators, uh, hormones from things like birth control pills. So again, much of these, many of these chemicals that we are putting into our bodies are ending up in the environment. Okay, but what concentrations are there? Are these just really low detection levels? So what you're seeing here is some data that kind of underscore that. So you're seeing a variety of different types of these pharmaceuticals on the uh, y-axis here in both cases. This is treated sewage on the left, so just coming directly out of a treatment plant. And this is surface water, usually you know, some ways down from those treatment plants. And what you're seeing here is the concentration. So put this in context, a nanogram per liter, so a thousand nanograms per liter here is equivalent to a part per billion. So we're seeing anywhere from one to 10 parts per billion very frequently in many of these systems. Okay, so just kind of highlight a few that I find interesting here. I always like to point out caffeine. So your Starbucks, that coffee you might have had this morning, um, you know, we're detecting that caffeine uh, kind of <laughs> on the other side of these treatment plants. Um, but you can also see various other ones. Um, so kind of highlight maybe ibuprofen here, very frequently detected uh, coming out of these sewage plants um, at, as well. So are these concentrations we should be concerned about? Keep in mind for many of these pharmaceuticals, they're designed to work at very low concentrations, so low doses. So these could be a concern. So I'm gonna do is provide an example here of one of these contaminants. So we'll focus on Prozac. Okay, so just a little bit about Prozac. It's a selective serotonin reuptake inhibitor. Okay, um, so serotonin, this regulates a wide range of behaviors in humans, including feeding activity, our uh, aggressive interactions, sexual behavior, as well as social hierarchies. So again, Prozac, by inhibiting the reuptake of serotonin, works to improve your mood level, decrease appetite, as well as decrease aggression. So we typically uh, prescribe this for things like depression, compulsive behaviors, and personality disorders. Okay, so that's your background on Prozac. The question becomes, well, what happens if Prozac ends up in the environment? What effects do we see on organisms? So the study I found for this comes from uh, the fish literature. So this is actually looking at predation rates. 
So in this case, they did experiments with a predator, which is the striped bass you see here, and then the fathead minnow. And this is the prey organism. So what they did is they fed these striped bass, um, these fathead minnows, and recorded the, the rate at which they consumed their prey. And what they found is if these fish were exposed to Prozac, it took them longer to eat each of their prey items. And in some cases, they completely stopped feeding. So essentially what we're seeing here is a parallel effect that we see in humans. So exactly what we observe in humans, we also see in these striped bass. That is a decrease in their appetite. So if we think about the pharmaceuticals that we consume and we take for various elements, the, the reason we prescribe them for whatever that might be, we might also see parallel effects in the wildlife and fish that might be exposed to those chemicals uh, once they leave the treatment plants. So again, this is a, a growing challenge. You know, the drugs that we use every day are gonna end up in these treatment plants and it really falls on the treatment plant uh, to remove those chemicals before getting out into the environment. And again, they're under limitations in terms of funding and their technology to be able to remove many of these. And also keep in mind, we're discovering um, drugs at a high rate. So our, our understanding of the broader ecological threat posed by many of these drugs is very limited. Okay, and importantly, you know, these chemicals are likely to impact growth, development, reproduction, survival of individuals, and this could play an important role in influencing interactions within communities as well as ecosystems. So again, I think this is a really great example to talk to students about uh, because it brings home something that they might have taken, right? They might have taken aspirin or Advil or something like that. They think about what happens if that gets in the toilet, goes in the treatment plant, and ends up in the environment. Okay, so this brings us to our third example, which are road de-icers. Again, another, um, another contaminant that students might th not think about once it you know, comes off that truck um, in the wintertime. So again, road de-icers, uh, there's multiple types in current use, including sodium chloride, which is uh, basically accounts for 90% of the total usage. But there's a variety of others that you can read here. Um, but what's important, is that over the past several decades, we've seen a, a dramatic increase in the amount of road salt that's used on US highways. So this is million of metric tons, so we're anywhere from 10 to 15 million metric tons that are used um, on our, our roads and uh, highways across the United States. But what we want students to think about though is, okay, that's applied to the road, okay? Is it gonna stay on that road? Not likely. So do the runoff, Okay, as that snow melts, it's going to end up getting into the soil and eventually, in some cases, can end up into aquatic systems. So in that case, we're basically converting what used to be a more freshwater system to a, a, a saline system, right, a salt system. Okay, so what are the ecological effects? Okay, we see this every day when we go out in the wintertime or after the wintertime in the spring. You know, this can be directly toxic to plants, so this, this line of... Um, damage to the plants that you see here is caused by basically salt spreader going down these sidewalks. Uh, we also see this in our, our lawns as well. So again, if you use a lot of salt on your sidewalks, you'll basically kill your lawn directly next to those sidewalks. Uh, it can also influence soil in a variety of ways, including the structure of the soil, the pH of the soil. Uh, it can also mobilize things like heavy metals. Okay, so for example, mercury can leach out of these systems because essentially the, the ions from the salt end up replacing the, the heavy metals and that kind of free them up to move. Um, but what I'll focus on here is the highly, um, it's highly toxic to freshwater organisms. Again, these are organisms that have evolved to deal with freshwater environments and now you're adding salt to those environments in which they're not adapted to. So this figure down here is kind of illustrating some of that. Uh, so this fish right here was raised in a salt environment. This one was raised in a freshwater environment. So you can see its body condition looks much lower. It's smaller in size. So it's a less healthy individual because it's been stressed by these salts that have been added to the system. So the lesson plan we've developed for your students is all based on assessing salt toxicity in daphnia or water fleas. So this is a daphnia here. Uh, and these daphnia play an important role in freshwater ecosystems. Um, they filter water of algae, so they keep the water clear. And they also serve as an important uh, food for things like fish, as well as amphibians and other species that are in those habitats. Um, so they play vital roles in freshwater systems. But they're also a really ideal test organism in ecotoxicology. Okay, so we use these as a model system to test contaminants in a variety of ways. Uh, and importantly, they're easy to obtain. So you can order them or you can go to natural ponds and wetlands and collect them. Um, they're easy to culture and they're very easy to work with given their small size. 
So what your students will do is basically conduct an LC50 experiment. This is uh, basically an experiment designed to determine the concentration, the lethal concentration, um, at which 50% of your test population um, dies from exposure to the contaminant. So again, they're gonna do this in the context of assault exposure. So these LC50 experiments are very simple and rapid assessments to look at survival. Okay, and this approach importantly can be adapted for other contaminants as well. So for example, if you wanna work with pesticides, you can very easily do that. Uh, you can do work with pharmaceuticals that I mentioned as well. So maybe caffeine or ibuprofen, all these things you can explore in this very simple LC50 context. So the lesson plan uh, will provide all the details. I just really quickly kind of demonstrate what the data would look like. Uh, so what you're seeing here is the results from LC50 experiment where you have salt concentration on the x-axis here and it's a percent mortality of the daphnia after 48 hours. So then simply calculate the LC50, all you gotta do is go from this 50% mark over to your line here and go down to what concentration that was and what you figure out that roughly 50% of your population expired when you had 0.53% um, salt concentration. So again, this is a very quick, rapid assessment to teach students about toxicology and then also start thinking about other ways to adapt this to um, maybe other contaminants or even other species you might be interested in testing. Okay, so this brings us to uh, the last focus, which is gonna be general threats to freshwater systems. So for students, um, again, I like to underscore the fact that freshwater is extremely vital for our drinking as well as agriculture, right? So these are resources we depend on for a variety of uh, reasons. Um, but importantly, this only accounts for 3% of total water on the planet. And of that, only about 0.5% is actually directly accessible. So what I mean by that is that's in a stream, a river, a lake, or a pond. Okay, the other portion of that fresh water is either in groundwater or things like glaciers and ice caps. So that's what this middle column is basically showing you here. Okay, so very little of that is actually directly accessible to um, us. But importantly, these freshwater systems are habitats through a broad diversity of species. So vertebrate, invertebrate, as well as plant species. And indeed, if you think about wetland systems, these are some of the most diverse systems that we have on the planet. Uh, so they're extremely important to the biodiversity uh, and the persistence of that biodiversity moving forward. And importantly, they also provide ecosystem services. Okay, so things like climate moderation, nutri nutrient cycling, uh, flood control, groundwater recharge, um, drinking water, as I mentioned before, uh, hydroelectric power when we put dams on these systems, uh, but also recreation, right? So there's a broad diversity of ecosystem services that we rely on these freshwater systems for. But unfortunately, these freshwater systems are highly imperiled. Okay, again, there's not um, that much of it on the planet, and we really stress them with our human activities. So this table here uh, kind of goes through some of these. I won't go through them all. Just kind of highlight a few. So climate change is a significant concern, um, especially if we get uh, variation and precipitation and those types of factors can um, influence persistence of, especially ephemeral uh, systems. Uh, infectious diseases are a concern. Harmful algal blooms, uh, where you have excessive nutrients getting into these systems and um, algae blooming and um, influencing the nutrient levels in these systems. And obviously emerging contaminants like we talked about, but a broad range of factors uh, kind of play a role in threatening these systems. So the lesson plan we developed um, is focused on trying to get students thinking about water quality. So in particular, focusing on pond systems that can easily be sampled. Uh, in particular, you're gonna look at eutrophication. So for many systems, especially in the agricultural Midwest, eutrophication is a big problem with nutrients like nitrogen and phosphorus, getting into these systems. And when these um, enter aquatic systems, especially at high levels, you can get things like sediment loading and excessive algal growth that can really uh, have a detrimental effect on that aquatic system. So what the students will be able to do is go out and collect water samples from various ponds and wetlands you might have identified in your local area, and hopefully you have a range of what you think are more pristine habitats to highly degraded habitats, maybe um, a residential pond or a pond in an agricultural setting. And what they can do is test the water quality. So they can look at the, the pH of those habitats, uh, the dissolved oxygen, uh, the amount of nitrogen and phosphorus, and correlate with that with the surrounding landscape around that pond and think about how that surrounding landscape has influenced the water quality in that, that local pond. 
Yeah, so again, all those details will be provided in the lesson plan and the teacher notes for you. Uh, so with that, I believe I'll turn it over to Rod. Great, thanks Jason. So I'm gonna switch gears here just a little bit and, and talk about some, some additional resources. But first I'd like to thank everybody for joining us for this professional development webinar entitled Ecotoxicology Part One, where Jason's provided a lot of information on the basics of, of toxicology. So I hope you consider participating in the second webinar on ecotoxicology to find out how to incorporate those lessons that Jason just provided an overview for, how you might incorporate those into your classroom. Now, if you've enjoyed this webinar, I encourage you to click on the card that should now be appearing in the upper right portion of your screen. If you click on that card, it'll take you directly to the Nature of Teaching YouTube channel. Here you can view sneak peeks of lesson plans that are directly related to the webinar that you just watched. If you're having a difficult time accessing that, that link and the card on the top right of your screen, I've also embedded the YouTube link uh, here in this PowerPoint slide. Or if you're in YouTube, you can simply search for the nature of teaching in that YouTube search bar. But essentially these lesson sneak peeks are two minute videos or less that really highlight those activities that are really exciting and unique as part of our, our curriculum. Now to ob obtain your certificate of completion for this 30 minute webinar, click on the card on the top right of your screen. So this is a second card that should be appearing. Once you click on that card, you'll be directed to a short Qualtrics survey that'll provide us with some feedback here on the Nature of Teaching program. Once you complete that Qualtrics survey, you'll automatically be emailed the certification of completion. So Jason, uh, just had a quick question for you, uh, but first I wanna thank you for sharing your knowledge and expertise with us today. If viewers that watch this webinar today have additional questions about ecotoxicology or the effects of contaminants on aquatic ecosystems, do they have a way they can reach out to you for answers? Yeah, sure. Um, they can feel free to email me. You see the, the email on the, the slide here. So it's jhooverma at uh, purdue.edu. Great. Again, thanks, Jason, for all your expertise. Now, if you have questions related to uh, your certification of completion or how to access our YouTube channel, you can email me directly at rodw.purdue.edu. So with that, we hope you enjoyed learning with us and consider, consider participating in many of our other professional development webinars offered here by the Nature of Teaching team. But until then, thank you for engaging our youth with nature. Until next time.